Hello, my name is Dave. Um, and my TED talk is uh, I, I am an anorexic. Uh, I have been recovering from anorexia for the past kind of eight or nine years. Uh, everyone needs a hobby. <laughs> And that's what this is all about. Um, and before we kick off, I am very comfortable talking about this. I don't want anyone to be awkward or kind of cringy. <laughs> like, you can see me, I'm not like butch or tough. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't even have a strong bladder, right? <laughs> it's what this is for, it's just a massive tenor man. <laughs> But then, like, if you, if you saw me in the street, you're not going to think, like, there's an alpha male. Right? Much more likely to think, oh, vegetarian. <laughs> um, you would be right, because um, I've, I've been veggie for a while now, right? And there are certain things that I miss, uh, <laughs> like respect. LAUGHTER uh, <laughs> But there is a very good reason I bring it up, because um, there were 1.6 million people in the UK that suffer with eating disorders. It's probably more, um, because a lot of people feel uh, embarrassed to talk about it, and a lot of people don't realise that they're suffering, and that was exactly the same for me. A lot of my friends, when I kind of slipped into all of this, asked me how I was losing so much weight so quickly, and I guess, yeah, I was embarrassed. Uh, and so I, I used to tell them it was a combination of the Atkins diet Coupled with being vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Just sounds much nicer, right? Because um, by trade, um, I, I am a stand-up comic. And I love the, the unique ability that comedy has to reach people. And I really wanted to use that in order to help and in order to change how we see mental health. Um, and it was, it was a difficult show to write. Um, it, was, it was a really tricky one because um, it had to be funny, but it also had to be informative as well. And it, obviously, I wanted to be sensitive. Like, we didn't always get the, the balance right. Uh, when we took it on tour to the Leicester Comedy Festival, one of the first reviews said that a bit that I did on bulimia was too gag heavy. <laughs> so it's in a show on domestic violence lacks punchlines, right? Um, but it's, it's absolutely true. And I, I want to promote change, especially towards mental health, because we haven't changed our attitude in the UK to mental health since the Victorian era, really. I mean, like, then we'd have freak shows, now we have reality TV, right? <laughs> We just haven't come that far, and I wanted to use that. And I will never forget the first time I ever tried the show, right? And um, it was awkward. It was horrible, it was awkward. Everyone was really, uh, and it wasn't ready. And after the show, uh, a woman came up to me, and she stood there and she said, you weren't really anorexic though, you know, were you? Uh, and I, <laughs> so I couldn't help but think, are you calling me fat? <laughs> I, and I said, it's all absolutely true. And she just turned around and she walked off. And I thought, I've offended this woman, right? And that is the last thing that I want to do. But then five minutes later, she came back and she stood there and she said, I can help you and I can help you get over this. And then from behind her back, she produced a packet of crisps. Right, like the answer to this neurological, psychological, mental health disorder was a packet of monster munch, right? <laughs> and it was only then that I realised how little people actually know about this. So I decided to start telling my story. And for me, this all began when I was 17 uh, and I just got the lead role in a play. Uh, it, it was a play called Sparkle Shark. <laughs> I'm not even gay, right? Uh, I'm as surprised as you. Uh, <laughs> so is my boyfriend, but... Um, and I'm not homophobic either, you know, some of my best friends enjoy musicals, but... <laughs> I, I am, of course, kidding. I'm a very left-wing person, very liberal, and the only thing I can't tolerate is gluten, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I got this role in this play, and um, I had to appear topless, and I guess that was the first time I've ever had to think about my body. Um, so I decided to, to lose a little bit of weight, right? I just did the usual thing, cut out snacking, just had breakfast, dinner, and tea, and I lost a bit of weight, wanted to lose a little bit more. So I cut out breakfast, just had dinner and tea, lost a bit of weight, wanted to lose a bit more, and then cut out breakfast and dinner, uh, and just had tea, and kind of lost a bit more. I mean, it was a great way to save money on food bills, right? Uh, although what I did lose in weight, I also lost in nectar points. <laughs> 
that's, it's not all happy families. <laughs> But as I lost the weight, something incredible happened. And I got noticed by this one amazing, beautiful, wonderful, awesome girl. Um, and, and for legal reasons, I'm not gonna name her. Uh, I'll get within 50 foot of her after this goes online. Um, but all you need to know is she was amazing. We started dating and I fell in love. And she became my heroine, right? Uh, by which I mean she was addictive, exciting, and blummin' expensive. Um, but like heroin, she also became a, a cause for me to lose weight. She became an inspiration to draw me on to lose more, more of my fat. Like, I, I, not that she ever made me, I really want to get that across as well. She actually never actively made me lose weight. Like, she hated that I was skinnier than her, right? I'll never forget one conversation like, does my bum look big in this? It's like, no, Dave. <laughs> over this. Um, but you have to understand that in my mind, I correlated getting skinny with getting this incredible girl, right? So in my mind, I correlated getting skinny with being good looking, skinny meant success. I, I know that's mental now. <laughs> like, I understand no girl has ever been asked, what do you look for in the ideal bloke? Oh, rickets. <laughs> But in my mind, that made sense. So inevitably, when we broke up and she broke me out, uh, that was when it spiraled out of control. Because if we're talking about change, one of the things that I want to change is that anorexia is not to do with vanity, uh, and it's very little to do with weight. It's about addiction, obsession, and control. So for example, I became absolutely obsessed with exercising. Anytime I'd eaten anything, no matter how much, I would run upstairs to my room, I would do 50 push-ups, I would do 50 sit-ups, and I would do 20 squats, right? And it was then that my mom and dad realized that something was up. Now, they never approached me, they never said anything to me about this, and I, I didn't know the reason until, until I asked them recently. And I said to my mom, why, when you knew something was up, why, with the exercise, why did you never say anything to me? She gave the most beautiful answer. She said, Dave, when your teenage son keeps on running up to his room and all you can hear is rhythmical banging, <laughs> followed by repeated grunting, right? You tend not to ask questions, right? <laughs> Joy thought it was really sweet until my dad just put his hand on her shoulder and went, I thought you were a sex pest. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sex pest, you never expected those words at TEDx. Um, <laughs> but also I became obsessed with weighing myself as well on a like, neurological level. So I started weighing myself in the morning, but then I started weighing myself in the evening to see how much my weight fluctuated, and then midday uh, to inspire me to eat less. Uh, and on average, about five times a day, I used to run upstairs, lock my door, and weigh myself. So five times a day, I used to lock myself away uh, <laughs> Dad thought I converted to Islam. <laughs> right. When he found out what was going on, he said, like, oh, I thought I was going to have to buy you a Quran, right? I said, Dad, look, we've been over this. I'm vegetarian, right? It's pronounced corn. <laughs> um, <laughs> Slight side note on that. When we did the Birmingham Comedy Festival, lovely Muslim fellow came up to me after the show, and he said, I really enjoyed the show. It's absolutely lovely. But you are, you are a very weak person, because what you call anorexia, us Islamists just call Ramadan. <laughs> uh, it's really nice. Um, um, so I also, I also became obsessed with calories as well, obsessed with calorie counting. Uh, and to reduce calories, I reduced portion sizes. Uh, so what I called Sunday lunch, everyone else just called tapas. Right, and I, because it was weird for mom and dad at this point in time, I'm cheaper to feed than the cat was, right? Uh, and they didn't know what to do. They went and sought help in the church and tried to like drag me along. Uh, as nowhere, I was going nowhere near that place, right? Bread and wine. Talk about empty calories, right? <laughs> I heard stories of miracles, I was entirely unimpressed. I just thought five loaves, two fishes, 5,000 people. Well, that's plenty to go around, you know? <laughs> Because I didn't realise I'd got a problem until I ended up in hospital. And I ended up in hospital due to coffee loading. A slight side note on that, in case you don't know what that is, coffee loading is where you substitute food for coffee. Because coffee gives you all of the energy, but none of the calories of food. Now, something you might not realise about coffee is that coffee reduces your pulse rate. And when you don't eat, because you've got no fuel in your body, that reduces your pulse too. And mine got down to about 46 beats a minute. 
If you get anywhere below 40, it's what's medically known as heart block. And unfortunately, it's incompatible with life. So I got rushed to the hospital. And as I sat there, I got talking to this building, uh, this builder. <laughs> It was going so well! Um, <laughs> don't worry, they'll fix that in the edit, right? <laughs> Just to ruin it, I'm gonna do it on this side now. The editor's gonna have a massive field day. Um, so, where were we? Serious point, thank you very much. Um, so I was there, I was talking to this builder. He's a lovely bloke, and it turns out he was there because he'd circular sword through his femur, right? <laughs> And after a while, we got talking and he said, anyway, enough about me, what about you? Why are you here? And let me tell you, nothing is more embarrassing in life than when you look at a bloke who's bleeding through the lower part of his body and you go, why am I here? Oh, too much coffee, isn't it? <laughs> you look like a bit of a word that I'm not allowed to say, right? Um, because it is bizarre, and like anorexia is a big problem. It affects people like Kelly Clarkson, Lily Allen, Victoria Beckham. It's a huge problem. You know, it's responsible for a lot of rubbish music. <laughs> <laughs> and I, those are famous female anorexics. I asked my housemate if he could name any famous male anorexics, and he just went, Gandhi? Right. <laughs> I said, no, because um, like, there, there is a, a gap in the market for the first famous male anorexic. <laughs> it's not a very big gap, but... Uh, <laughs> and that's not why I'm doing this. I, I'm not doing this. I don't want fame or glory. You know, I'm not doing it for that. I don't want to be on telly, right? You know, the camera adds 10 pounds. You can go away. Um, men are much more likely to get uh, bulimia as well, that's something I meant to say. Uh, men are much more likely to get bulimia. Only about 90% of uh, anorexics that we know of are, are, uh, are female. About 10%, they reckon anywhere between 10 and 25% are male, and that's kind of on the increase. Men are much more likely to get bulimia. Um, so there's a lot of famous examples of male bulimics. Uh, people like Elton John was bulimic. Uh, so Rocket Man, it's all about salad, right? <laughs> and it's an incredibly big problem in the UK, and I know that because I am, I am lucky and honoured uh, to work with an incredible charity called BEAT, uh, UK's largest eating disorder charity, and they, they gave me an award for the show and the tour last year, which was wonderful. Uh, and I have a woman there that manages me called Rebecca, right? And when we went to the Edinburgh Fringe, I realised as I got on the train, I needed to send Rebecca at BEAT an email, so I pulled a pen out of my pocket and wrote on the back of my hand, BEAT Rebecca. Right. Can you imagine what the bloke next to me thought, right? Because mine, this is just some really lazy domestic abuse, right? Uh, but I was, I, was in a really, I was in a really cheeky mood, so I just looked at him and went, she deserves it, right? So, but just before Christmas as well, I, I found out, I'm very lucky and honoured, uh, I am the ambassador of a charity that helps promote the idea that men get eating disorder too. Um, and they're absolutely wonderful. So I'm now their media representative. I do all their TV, radio and press interviews. Also, subsequently, there is an interview with me uh, in a newspaper. I'm not allowed to say which one, but it rhymes with the Pladian. Uh, <laughs> Right, I did this interview with them on the topic of male anorexia, something I feel really strongly and really seriously about, and they coined... The, I didn't realise the media have coined this phrase, manorexia, right? Have you... Like, just, it's just the worst phrase, like, manorexia. It just sounds like the world's worst superhero, right? Like, you've got, like, manorexia and bulimia boy taking on the world one calorie at a time. It's like, it's like oh, no, it's that evil nemesis. It's carbohydrate. <laughs> <laughs> Got their psychic, lack of iron, man. Uh, <laughs> isn't doing anything, he just faints, you know. <laughs> In comes Captain Anemia. Uh, there's loads of them. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a ball. What a lot of lols. Um, <laughs> but besides all the jokes, besides all the mucking about, there is a really serious point that I wanted to leave you with, and that's the anorexia. One in four anorexics either tries to or is successful at taking their own lives. It has the highest mortality rate of any mental health disease. And people say to me now, 
are you over it? And I know that this is something that I'm gonna have for the rest of my life. But the real question is, can I deal with it? And I can deal with it now because I can talk about it. And I wanna talk about it and show that it's nothing to be ashamed of. And I wanna talk about it so that we can help sufferers. And I wanna talk about it so that we can get that woman to realize that no, a packet of monster munch is not how you get over anorexia. I just wanted to say it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much.